my talk is about uh, high performance um, in the browser when it comes to the critical rendering path. Um, and this really means uh, trying to get the content as fast as possible to the users and uh, not worry too much about the fancy stuff that's behind. Um, and this is something that I care about because I have a blog and uh, I uh, wrote my own engine for client-side rendering and uh, it was terrible, right? Uh, you got the loading spinner for like six seconds and then maybe uh, you get to see the content after that if um, rendering didn't fail on the client side or anything. So, yeah, I wanted to do better. Um, in order to do that, you first have to know where you are, and in, uh, in order to do that, you have to measure uh, how your performance looks like for your site. So, what is going on, right? There's plenty of ways that you can actually measure that uh, and get very detailed feedback about what your site is doing. Um, one of the quickest ways of uh, finding out is using DevTools. Um, you just open them up, go to the audits tab, run it, and it, you'll, give, uh, you'll get some feedback about um, whether you need to ship your content or not, whether you need to concatenate and minify, stuff like that, but also um, where you need to cache your assets, uh, where you need to uh, move scripts to the bottom, things like this that are pretty basic. Um, and I think there's something about uh, optimizing images as well in there, but I'm not really sure. Um, there's also a page speed insights. This one is a little, a little trickier to run because you have to visit a website, I know. Um, and you put your, uh, your page, like bonifo.com in it, uh, you run it, and you get back a lot of uh, different insights. Um, the cool thing is that they're divided between uh, mobile and desktop, so you even get some UX mixed up in there, um, like uh, this button is too small, so this is also uh, going to impact negatively in your score, you get score, um, that tells you roughly uh, how well or badly your site's doing. Um, and it also has some more uh, advanced uh, techniques that it suggests for you, like uh, inlining critical CSS, and that's something we'll uh, get into uh, in a while, uh, which is pretty cool. Something Google ha had been pushing for a long time, uh, the last year, and not so much this year, but I guess we're, we're already, all of us, using it, so it's cool. Um, and then there's web page test, which is yet another tool. It's also web, um, but in this case, uh, you have to put your site in a queue and wait for the queue to uh, clear up, and then the tests run on your site. Um, and Christian is going to hit me if I don't do this, so uh, you need to run these tests uh, two or three times to, get sure, uh, to make sure that the results are accurate. Uh, run them on different uh, connections. There's a ton of locations that you can use, like mobile or, uh, or Frishy or whatever, uh, and also like different places around the world. So it's pretty cool to test out different scenarios from, for different connections and places. Um, and what it gives you is uh, incredibly detailed, so it's well worth uh, waiting in line uh, on the queue. Um, you get uh, different grades for uh, different parts of the performance in your site, like uh, the time to the first byte in the connection, uh, whether Keep Alive is enabled or not, whether you're using a CDN or not, whether you're uh, compressing the content, uh, the text content in your site, whether you're compressing images or not, and whether you're caching uh, static content. You also get a little timeline view that says basically uh, how long it took to get to different milestones in the connection the first time around and the second time around. And this is important distinction because uh, the second time around, supposedly, uh, your cache is primed, so everything has uh, the, the bulk of the site is already cached, uh, so it must uh, be much faster if we are doing things right. And you also get the, uh, the uh, timeline view, 
I think it's called, uh, where you can tell like the different uh, resources blogging on each other. Um, so yeah, you have the grades, and there's also um, a page speed score that's the same one as the, as the one in uh, page speed insights. Um, and then the, the, the timeline view is pretty awesome because you get to uh, easily notice what's blocking what and the connection if you have a bunch of JavaScript in your head or, uh, or near the top of the body. Uh, you'll notice that it's blocking. Um, and in this case, you'll obviously notice that uh, the CSS is blocking on everything else. And once it downloads, uh, the fonts in the CSS are blocking on everything else. So you probably want to load all of that asynchronously and save like a second or two uh, for your users. So we'll look into doing that in a bit. And uh, you also get, uh, you know, the grades that we had. Uh, they're also um, separated across uh, all the requests in the site, so you can tell, uh, like, probably uh, if you're having a low uh, caching score, it's probably third-party content that's not being cached by your an analytics trackers and whatnot. So don't worry that much about it. Like, what can you do? You're not the bearish anyways. So it could be worse. Uh, and then you have uh, the uh, film strip view where you can easily tell visually uh, how your site loads and uh, it's actually video, you can watch the thing. Um, and it's cool because you can use it in, on different connections and whatnot and, uh, and see it frame by frame uh, how the, the page uh, gets loaded and you can uh, easily tell if something is uh, not right with fonts, like if you're using custom fonts, uh, you'll see uh, a lot of blanks uh, until the font uh, gets loaded. Um, so we'll see how to load that asynchronously too and use some web safe font at first so that the content gets there faster. Um, and yeah, sorry. Uh, and that gives you uh, what's called a speed index. That's basically the, uh, the time it takes for the, uh, for the page to load visually. Um, and yeah, it's a complex definition, so it's up in the slides. I posted them on Twitter, so you can uh, follow them later if you want to, to click on the links. Things are actually linked, so yeah. Um, so web page test uh, gives you a very detailed inspection of every uh, request. It analyzes TCP traffic down to the packet level, so it's pretty overwhelming, but also useful. Um, and it helps you identify bottlenecks by visualizing progress. Um, it makes it really, really easy to uh, extract actionable data from those uh, reports. So use it. Um, yeah. But the problem is that if you go home right now, you're probably going to do, do this just once or even before going home, right? You're going to. Uh, Pop, up, uh, pop open a web browser, go to your site, open the tools, run the audits thing. Oh, it looks pretty good. I guess I'll move this uh, style tag over here, and that's about it. Or maybe you live and use the R2 tools, but um, the point I'm trying to make is that you should integrate this into your builds and have it become a habit of, uh, of your builds and uh, make sure you measure things early and often. Um, and even uh, you could enforce um, some sort of uh, limits where you say, okay, performance must be this low to pass the bar, otherwise the build's not going to be, even be deployed. Um, so let's talk about that a little. Um, you could use PSI, which is a no shares model. Um, you can install it. Uh, and use it uh, as a, with the, their API, or you can use the command line tool. Um, and there's also like grant or ungold tasks uh, that, to use it. Um, when you use the command line tool, you get uh, the same report basically, but uh, in text format, so it's easy to read. For web page tests, it's a little bit more uh, complicated because, uh, like I said earlier, you get put into a queue, so you have to. Uh, request that first and then pull the API until you get uh, the results back. But the results are like tremendous, so you should do it. Um, 
You could wrap this around uh, some higher level API, of course, that does the waiting for you, but they don't make any assumptions on your behalf. Um, and then there's uh, Wiselow, which is kind of older, so I didn't really bring it up earlier. But there's also like tools for all the places. Um, so like I said, you, you should strive to m mix these measurements into your build, but it's pointless if you don't do anything about them, right? If you just set up a nice dashboard that says, OK, here's how performance progressing build by build, it doesn't really change a lot of how the actually uh, how the site actually works. So if you enforce a performance budget that says, um, OK, so we can make at most uh, three meg in image requests or something like that, um, you can actually uh, set a limit for how the performance in your site will uh, work. So what kind of things can we track? Well, there's a ton of things that we can track, actually. So. Um, some of the easiest ones are quantity-based metrics, and this basically means like request counts or page weight uh, and stuff like that. Um, then there's uh, milestone timings that are like the time to the first tweet and whatnot. Um, the even easiest way to do this is um, rule-based metrics like uh, your white slow grade or your page speed score or stuff like that. And then there's the uh, speed index. I think it's one of the most, uh, most like, all-encompassing uh, metrics that you could use. Um, but you should probably mix and match these and try to find a, a, a lower limit that works for you. So to enforce all of those, you could use something like Grand Perf Budget. Uh, it's a nice tool that allows you to uh, define a, a metric ton of different uh, properties that you want uh, to make sure your uh, site meets. So what can we do to, to actually improve performance be, be beyond measuring it and, uh, and trying to enforce a, a good level, a good baseline? Um, well, we could look at the whole web stack and see what improvements we can make in each of the different places, right? So let's start with the network layer. Um, if you want to, yeah, just read that book. Don't even bother listening to me. Um, so high performance browser networking. If you're into this kind of stuff, read it. If you're not, read it anyways, <laughs> because it's that good. So it talks about uh, TCP, HTTP, UDP, uh, WebSockets, WebRTC, all this new stuff, HTTP2. So you should really read this. Um, it also mixes stuff with uh, UX and the, also the notion that not everyone's on a desktop with a, a Mac, uh, late, latest generation and uh, like the best uh, broadband connection. So um, there, there are some very good points uh, in there. So to optimize TCP, there's two things that we could do. Um, we should uh, make sure we have the latest version of our OS, typically Linux or any Linux fork, um, because that will increase the initial TCP uh, window size, and that means uh, you get more throughput in the connection and less uh, ramp up time to get started uh, sending data to the client. And then we also should disable slow start restart, which basically is a TCP thing where if a connection goes idle for a little bit, uh, it'll go back to uh, safe levels of throughput. But the problem with that is that um, we don't want that because HTTP is uh, very bursty. So you get a request, you get a response, and then nothing for a few seconds, maybe. So disable that if you want to have Keep Alive have a, an actual impact on your site. Um, when it comes to HTTP, obviously make less requests, right? I can go home and enjoy my Argentina asado. Um, <clears throat> but this is something we've been doing for a long time, right? Uh, with concatenation and image spriting and stuff like that. Um, but there is also the fact that we should be architecting, architecturing our um, backend uh, APIs to meet the needs of the front end and not the other way around, because that doesn't make any sense. 
So yeah, we should turn on keep alive because uh, this allows us to reuse a single TCP connection and save a lot of uh, handshaking, which isn't cool. I don't like shaking hands. Um, so <laughs> she see all the text, the uh, content, obviously. I don't think there's a lot of explaining there. Um, I'll expire Sanitag header so that you can cache uh, your content. Um, especially static content, obviously, but also like HTTP, uh, HTML responses. Use a CDN if you have to. Um, do some research and figure out where um, CDNs are actually useful in your use case. Like if you have a blog, don't use a CDN. Or maybe use Cloudflare, but yeah. Don't put that much time into it. Not worth it. So HTTP2, speedy, yes. We should definitely use these things, but uh, why? Well because you have non-blocking multiplexing. That's basically, um, since we are going to be using a single TCP connection uh, rather than multiples, um, we basically reuse the same TCP connection for all a, a HTTP requests. Um, and that's awesome, because you get less hands even less handshakes, um, and you get to um, not be blocked and not have to do sharding and not have to do concatenation and stuff like that to improve performance. Um, so it's awesome. Um, you also get header compression, which is basically uh, a map built of all the headers that have been seen by either party. And then if they are uh, sent again, uh, you shall send the, the mapping instead of the header. So you save a lot of bytes even in in each request, so it's pretty cool. And there's also a proactive server push, which is basically, here's the HTML, and you'll probably want these JavaScript files and these CSS files, so the, the data can be sent all together and not wait on the HTML like we typically, did, uh, we typically do. So HTML. Uh, render HTML on the server first, because content's all that matters, and then worry about becoming a single page app later. Um, you could do this uh, today, so we'll look into that later. Um, defer non-critical asset loading, again, content skink, so yeah, ditch the rest till the end. Um, yeah, and keep it accessible with area attacks, obviously. Um, so optimizing CSS, inline critical CSS, this is great. Uh, what you do basically is, um, you take the important CSS and uh, put it into a style tag and defer the rest. It's great. We'll look into it later. Um, remove and use styles. Um, avoid M domains. Be responsive. Uh, don't try to identify experiences in either mobile or desktop. Just don't. Um, concatenate and minify, obviously. Uh, we're not in HTTP2 yet. Um, follow a style guide, seriously. Like any style guide will do, any style guide. But uh, seriously, one of them, obviously, not many. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, yeah, because you work in a team, so let's try and act like one. Um, load fonts asynchronously. Fonts are crazy expensive, so if you have custom fonts, load them asynchronously. Use a fallback while those font loads, uh, like a, a web safe font, um, yeah. So that'll help you prevent uh, flashes of uh, invisible text like we've seen in the film strip view earlier. Um, and you can then add a class name or something when the font actually loads using JavaScript and yeah, that's fixed. So use fewer fonts and avoid repaints. Nice thing to say, but like, yeah, you can tell your designer that quite, because they'll be like, we can't change the whole design because performance. Well, you should have worked together uh, in the first place, right? So in your next project, do that. Talk to your designer. Talk about performance within them and uh, educate each other on what matters. Um, turns out constraints are important to design, so if you want fewer fonts, you can have them, but in the beginning, don't just try to remove fonts from their designs. Um, and yeah, they're expensive, so cache them aggressively. 
uh, images, minify and shrink. So, yeah, minify we all do, right? Like uh, you take an image, you run it through some cloud thing that makes it smaller. It's magic. Um, but shrinking is also important because if you have user uploaded uh, content like uh, screenshots or stuff like that, your Mac is taking like six Mac screenshots. Um, and you probably don't want to be serving six Mac uh, images in your homepage. So shrink them, make them smaller, like 900 pixels wide, and uh, they'll be much smaller too in size. So you probably don't need the actual image to display them. You can still allow them to download that if that's important to the uh, use case, but yeah. Think about performance always. Um, the four images below default, that's something that we know to do, but we seldom do. Um, so instead of loading them all, all at once, load them as the user calls and have the, the snide fading thing if you have the time. Um, create spreadsheet using tools, don't have the designer do them by hand because that sucks for the designer. Um, Try inlining uh, tiny dynamic images, like if you have some sort of gravatar-ish thing that's not quite gravatar, consider inlining them because uh, the document will load faster as a result. But this is something, again, that's useful in HTTP 1.1, not so useful in HTTP 2.0. So in 10 years, I'll probably be uh, going over these slides again and uh, saying the opposite of most of my advice, but anyways. Um, <clears throat> use CSS for simple icons, like if you need a, a cross or a circle or a tick or something like that. Try and use CSS if you can get away with that. You should be able to live without JavaScript, and this really means, well, it's a JavaScript conference, right? But uh, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so what, what this means is, um, your content should be able to live without JavaScript. And that means um, you should render stuff on the server first and then worry about adding uh, pretty things and emojis afterwards. So you should be able to defer all your JavaScript and uh, just load the content first, defer all non-critical assets, and then use small modules, uh, use asset hashing and caching to um, to make sure that the content is only downloaded when it changes and it's needed. Um, and cache vendor scripts separately, so uh, because those don't change as much, usually. So how do we do all of that? OK, so first thing first, uh, we'll go back to the network stack. Um, let's start with Nginx. Nginx is a reverse proxy. Well, you can use it as a reverse proxy. It has a static asset ha uh, caching by default. It's really easy to, to, to do that. Uh, it supports some sort of speedy uh, through a module that you can use. So you can get sort of like HTTP uh, 2.0 perf improvement. Um, it has gzip compression built into it. You just add a, a single line in, in your config file. So use it. Uh, you can put it in front in, uh, of your uh, web servers, <clears throat> so it's pretty useful. Set up a CDN, um, consider it again, not something that you should always do, but uh, if in doubt, try out Cloudflare, it's like five seconds. If, not, if you actually know that for a fact that you want this, use Fastly or something more enterprisey. but uh, you could also use uh, CloudFront with uh, Amazon S3, that works. Um, for shard rendering, um, there, there aren't a lot of options because you have like Backbone needs render, which sucks. Uh, you have Angular in 2.0, maybe. You have Ember, uh, which was supposed to have it, but uh, it's basically like uh, for web crawlers only. Uh, so. You have Tonus, which is this weird thing I built and nobody uses, so that's not good either. Um, <laughs> and you have React, which is the only reasonable thing to use nowadays for shard rendering. 
And the problem is, even though people use React, they still don't do shared rendering. Even Instagram doesn't, so uh, whatever. So defer uh, assets, like I said. If it's a uh, script, just uh, the async tag, uh, the async attribute to tag. Um, but remember, uh, well, no, not yet. Um, link tags, uh, you can use that snippet. Basically, all it does is it creates the link tag programmatically, but sets the media type to only X, which is invalid. So after a timeout, for some reason, you set the media type to all, which is the legal value, and that'll make it load asynchronously. I have no idea how this works, but it works. So still, let's try to be progressive and use a no script tag that actually loads this, uh, the link tag without JavaScript. Um, and you use CSS, because Bootstrap, right? Uh, we add Bootstrap to our sites, and then we use a couple classes like red, and then uh, don't use it for anything else. So there's this package called unCSS, which removes all the uh, things that nobody cares about and just gives you the actual CSS, and you can put that back into file and uh, serve that instead, so you save some bytes. Um, inline critical CSS, this one is huge. Try it, research it. Um, you can use Penthouse for this. Penthouse basically is a, a, a Phantom JS plugin that you can run against a site and tell it, uh, here's my CSS. And what it'll do is um, load up your CSS with Phantom uh, your page with Phantom JS, uh, figure out what the um, the above default content is, and that means uh, like what you're seeing now, imagine if that was a page that continues below default. Uh, so the critical CSS is all that's needed to render that, and everything else is uh, non-critical, so it can be uh, deferred. So yeah, do that. Use a font loader um, to render the font asynchronously. Optimize images using image mean. Um, uh, it has plugins for all types of images, so use it. You can create sprite sheets using SpriteSmith. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's pr pretty easy to use, CLI, API, whatnot. Inline images with data URI, just a command line tool, has an API too. Uh, you, can, you should use a module system like browser, fire, babel. Um, and yeah, you become a goddess or a god. <laughs> so two more things. Perf School, uh, it's a common line workshop thing I built uh, where you can run through all these scenarios and uh, play with them. Uh, it's pretty, like, explains you and holds your hand along the way, so try it. Um, I wrote the book, JavaScript Application Design. I talk about a lot of this stuff in it. Um, but also like uh, more in the build automation, uh, MVC testing, REST APIs, and whatnot. Uh, if you don't want to buy it, I have a couple of free copies, but also uh, GitHub slash build first slash build first um, code samples for free, yay. So thanks everyone.